Welcome to the Coin Stories podcast, where we get to explore the future of money, business, technology, and Bitcoin's revolutionary promise to boost economic prosperity around the world and mend our broken financial system. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm here to learn with you. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. None of the discussions should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. This podcast is made possible through partnerships with companies I trust, and I'm very picky about who I choose to partner with, so I hope you take the time to listen to the ad reads throughout the show. Thanks for joining me, and if you like this type of content and want to see more of it, make sure to hit that like button. All right, it's time for the show. Welcome back to Coin Stories. Super excited because one of my most popular guests is back investment strategist Lynn Alden, who recently came out with her book, Broken Money. So excited to talk to you about this, Lynn. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Well, I tried to watch all the other interviews to make sure that I'm not, you know, repeating a bunch of topics that maybe the audience has already heard, especially if they they went out and read the book. Um, but let's just start out with this. Are you more or less bullish on Bitcoin since writing this book, which you say is not, it's not a Bitcoin book, uh, but obviously we, we learned a lot about Bitcoin by reading it. I think the more I learn about it, uh, and Bitcoin's one of those things, it's, it's complex enough that you all, like no matter how long you've researched it, you're always are still learning about it. Um, but the more I learn about it, the, the more bullish I get. Um, and at the same time, I kind of view it as, the only realistic method to change some of our monetary aspects. So one of the big themes in the book is kind of like technological determinism, which is that things kind of had to turn out this way, at least for this time period, just due to the kind of the or like the order of technologies that emerged and that naturally would emerge, uh, but we're kind of stuck in this local maximum of money uh, where transaction speeds are very fast, but settlement speeds of anything scarce like gold have been very slow. And so we've kind of had the century and a half of necessary abstraction, and that's easy to centralize and control and leverage. Um, and Bitcoin is the first and, and really only credible way to break out of that. So while I'm never 100% sure on any asset, you know, there's 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 all sorts of challenges and, and frictions that can happen. Um, but if it's not Bitcoin, I don't really know what else it would be. So I think that's, that's how I'd phrase that. You know, one thing that I noticed you said near the beginning of the book, as well as in the very last chapter, is the concept that politics can change things locally and temporarily, but technology can change things globally and permanently. Can you kind of dig into that thought? I mean, since clearly you mentioned it more than once for a reason. Yeah, I think, I mean, there are technologies and sometimes there are things that we think of as basic today, like running water, for example, or refrigeration, where... You know, you don't like. You just have to show people it exists, and then they want it, right? You don't have to like convince them. You don't have to uh, force them to get it. It's just like it, engineers can sometimes make something so good that that just it permanently solves a problem almost for everyone over time as it becomes more and more uh, accessible. And that's something that you know politicians can't really do. And you know, it, any sort of like like ideas and things like that, or governance structures and things like that, they're inherently these temporary local phenomena, right? So some countries, uh, if they're governed well, are going to do better than other countries for that that epoch, like that period of time. Um, but technology can just change things globally, and then that change is permanent. Like we, we have refrigeration, and more and more people have access to it, almost everybody now. And that's just a permanent part of the human experience now. And I kind of view the same thing as money like applying to money, which is that when certain things happened, it it changed how we interact with money, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse, uh, because you can actually, in some ways, have a technology that has consequences to it. Um, and so it's one of those things where I think a lot of the criticisms of central banks and monetary kind of governance in general, while I agree with a lot of them, when we look around and we see that it's happening literally everywhere, uh, that's not like a coincidence. That's basically, a, it's been a technological limitation uh, that moved incentives in that direction. So the way I describe it in the book, there's 160 different fiat currencies. Um, you know, some of them are pegged to the dollar, but a lot of, you know, pegs can break. Um, and a lot of the other ones are free floating. And so you have all these little currency bubbles and you ask, why is it like this? Why why isn't, you know, out of 200 countries, why isn't one on a gold standard? Or why, why isn't one um, kind of doing free banking? 
right? The, the, the fact that every single country, pretty much, uh, at least any country of scale, that's not just like, say, using the dollar or something, um, but every country of scale does things this, this general way. And I think that's, that's basically been a, there's been a technological reason for that. And unless or until you have wide usability of fast settlement, which is with Bitcoin being the first credible way to do that, and so far the most liquid, most decentralized, most immutable way of doing that, uh, then that problem doesn't really solve it. So I think instead of just complaining about the Fed or uh, complaining about the system and kind of like waiting for it to blow up and then trying to protect yourself, I think there's this is like the era where if Bitcoin is going to succeed, it's got to be built um, and people have to go out and build that parallel system. And if you if you're successful and it's like refrigeration where you don't have to convince people that, to want refrigeration, it's just obvious. Um, Bitcoin just has to be better uh, than the alternatives. And that's what makes it win. That's such a good point. And you're right. We need to build the world that we want to see. Um, before we dig into Bitcoin a little bit more, you covered so much of the history of money, which I always find fascinating. And I kind of wish I learned it um, in school because I could just read about it forever. Uh, let's talk first a little bit about the 1800s and sort of the era of, of free banking. Because one thing that I feel like um, the general public believes or, or understands is that that free banking was so volatile and that it led to all these massive booms and busts. And that's why we essentially uh, centralized into the Federal Reserve. And I, w I was hoping that you could just shed a little bit more light on that, because as I've done more reading, including your book, it seems like, yes, there were booms and busts, but they were exaggerated in the way that we kind of learned about it in our educational system. Um, and that actually uh, the market is a good self-regulator, especially if we don't intervene too much, because if we intervene, it can exacerbate it like I, I believe it did in the in the 1930s. So can you shed a little bit of light on that? And uh, and and what was the quality of life during the time of, of free banking? Sure. So, you know, in modern times, free banking often has a bad reputation, especially central bankers generally push the idea that free banking was unstable. And that's why central banking uh, is needed. Um, and while there is some truth to it, basically fractional reserve banking in general is is going to have some instability to it. It's an inherently unstable system, um, but it's a very different environment. And there were it was applied in multiple different regions, and so there were varying levels of success. I, I think one thing to keep in mind is that the 1800 United States was basically what we would consider like an emerg emerging market today, right? So. We were like, you know, they were discovering land, they were settling land. It was a federation of new states being added to the union. Um, that was a very different environment than, say, England or, you know, other other kind of parts of the more developed world at the time, like Sweden, right? So if you look at the success rate of free banking in other environments, um, such as Scotland or Sweden or even Canada, uh, you generally had a better track record than you had in the United States. Um, in addition, the United States won, like a, a factor that I think uh, hampered it was the fact that every state had their own rules, uh, some strict, some loose for how a bank operates. And it was hard to be a bank with branches in multiple states. And that can smooth out the risk of bank runs and things like that. So if you start from the premise that fractional reserve is inherently unstable, which I would argue it is, there are still ways in which you can mitigate that instability. Like you can have higher reserve requirements. You can have a, a broader and larger and more diversified deposit base. Uh, there are various things you can do to reduce the frequency or the severity of crises. Um, but you know, over time, the, because these, the model itself has some degree of instability, I think eventually it kind of shifts more towards central banking. Because when you have a, a system where, um, you know, when people think of fractional reserve, I think another way of describing it is duration mismatching. I think I think when people hear fractional reserve or full reserve banking, they often think that that means a world with no credit, like there's no lending, mm -hmm. which is not the case. It just means that deposits and lending are duration matched. So if you if you give someone a two year loan or a five year loan, that's backed up by a two year certificate of a deposit or a five year certificate of deposit, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a system that has not really developed anywhere. Uh, in large part because if there is a central authority that can come in and help you bill you out or change the rules in your favor, uh, it's it's generally more profitable to make that promise of liquidity for the depositors that so you can pull your money at any time, even though the majority of money is not there. 
Um, and so that's been a a variable of history that that you know has been a problem uh, for centuries. And central banking is one one way that it gets addressed, but of course there's a big cost of how that's addressed. It basically means that everything gets centralized and now currency is always diluting. Uh, so we don't have to worry about you know realistically going to a bank and the bank doesn't have the money. Uh, instead, we have to worry about the fact that our the value of our assets in our bank just keeps going down because we've taken away like the the prospect for loss, but instead we just continually print and smooth it out over the course. Um, so free banking is one of those things where both critics and defenders of it, I think, have certain points because the inherent kind of function of banks in that environment is just unstable. Um, but it's not always the instability that a central bank would argue it was, especially if you cherry pick the, the, the jurisdictions where it had the most problems and ironically wasn't as free as other jurisdictions. Well, in your research of this evolution from sort of free banking to various uh, central banks, ultimately culminating in, in 1913 with the, the Federal Reserve Act, um, can you talk a little bit about wealth concentration? Because one thing that I feel like when I discuss maybe the history of um, the gold standard and and the, going from the era of the Great Depression to sort of a, what what most people would consider to be America's greatness. A lot of people say, well, under under the gold standard and with free banking, it was an era of the robber barons and this incredible wealth concentration. And so uh, there's this fear that we could return to it if we have hard money again. What do you say to that? Well, so if you look at the statistics, we're about as concentrated now as they reached back then. So we, we've already reached the wealth concentration of the, of the you know, Gilded Age. Um, if you kind of look at wealth concentration you had it was it was rising you know up until the early uh, 1900s and then starting with the great depression and the and the world war ii and the kind of the the redistribution that happened it started falling into the 70s and then it began rising again uh so the the height that we've reached now is actually similar to or even slightly larger to the height that it was back then so it was a degree of wealth concentration but i think another factor to consider is what was the source of money creation? I mean, of wealth concentration, right? So in that in that era, a lot of the wealth concentration went to these these big industrialists that were actually solving problems for people. And sure, a lot of them had like unethical aspects to their business and and you know kind of aggression there. Um, but in general, the quality of life for a person was materially increasing from decade to decade, right? So. Uh, you know, if you looked at people in the, in the 1920s compared to the 1880s, for example, and, and says, you know, are you better off than your parents were? Normally, the answer would be yes, because you had things like electrification and internal combustion engines and railways and, all, you know, all the things that we take for granted today. A lot That was a very strong period of, of growth. And those that um, were at the top of the leading companies, of course, acquired a lot of wealth in the process. But I think the main variable is not wealth concentration per se that's the problem it's whether it's unfair wealth concentration like are there is 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 you know cronyism kind of like siphoning money in one direction or another direction or another way of looking at it is the average person is their life getting better or worse over time and more specifically do their kids have a better life than their parents did and so right now we're in an environment where by many metrics kids are not no longer having a better uh, quality of life than their parents, um, by health outcomes, by income outcomes, all sorts of different uh, variables. You can look at that. And that wasn't really the case back then. So I, I think that is a more concerning aspect to be aware of. Um, you know, when I um, went to Egypt recently, um, there's like a lot of kids that just never go to school, right? There's a certain percentage of kids that you just see them on the street and they're like selling bread. And they're not homeless. It's just that their their family's so poor that the kid just goes right into work and doesn't get an education, and therefore kind of gets stuck in this trap. And that was the case a lot back then, but that's it's kind of just an unfortunate part of developing, and or something that you can fall back into if 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 the society is having a problem. So it's not to say that there weren't a lot of problems in the Gilded Age. I mean, you had like kids working in factories right. in dangerous conditions. Um, you know, there were a lot of issues, uh, but that was just kind of a, and you see that in, in, in China and in like the sweatshops back in, you know, a couple decades ago, that's almost like a passage that so far economies kind of have to go through if they're going to get to what's on the other side. Um, 
you know, maybe there are ways to, to run that better than other ways. Uh, but in general, I would say it wasn't hard money itself that was the problem. It was just, it was, I mean, the process of industrialization, kind of like how certain monetary technologies have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, there are certain parts of industrialization that had advantages and disadvantages. So, you know, instead of like running your own homestead, you're in like a dirty factory uh, working for someone else. But we have to keep in mind, a lot of people went from the rural areas to the cities for those opportunities because they would get paid more and then their kids would be better off after their sacrifice. Um, but of course there were, you know, there were a lot of challenges or things we view as unethical today. Um, and that still unfortunately happens in a lot of places around the world of just like kids working way too young and not having a chance to get education um, and, and things like that. Well, and especially in the countries that are so far away from from the dollar, and we've had such a privilege being the global reserve currency, which I want to ask you about because you wrote um, some fascinating things about when you artificially strengthen a, a currency. But first, just to just to kind of um, wrap a bow on on your last note, you know, I think every single day I see a, a meme or a post about this general feeling of frustration that back in the seventies are parents uh, or previous generations could purchase a house on one income in the 70s and and here they are able to sell it for you know 500% more now it's worth millions even though it needs a ton of work and and it's like people um they haven't gone through the 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 process of learning about why the money's broken but if you could sum it up i mean having dug through fractional reserve banking, the evolution of the settlement um, layers and and all the things that you researched in your book, if you could just pinpoint it to the general public, why this happened? Why is it that it's so much harder to afford an asset like a house today than in the 1970s, making it so that people even with two incomes are finding it hard to just tread water? What would it be? How do you explain that to the general public? So I would say that in this environment since the 1970s, the base ledger of money that we use has become a lot more flexible because it's not constrained by any real world constraint like the amount of gold. Um, and because it's so flexible, um, centralized forces can manipulate it in ways that benefit themselves or those, th those close to them. And so you kind of get this marriage between corporations and government uh, where corporations can influence government to favor them Governments can select who wins or who loses in a crisis. And a lot of it comes down to the provision of cheap credit. Um, and so basically this has been a world where the bigger get, get bigger, uh, the smaller struggle, uh, the closer you are to the money source, that's more important. It's better to go into finance than into engineering as a profession usually, basically. That, that's, that's, I would say that's not a, a super healthy sign of an economy um, when you know, basically financial middlemen are the ones that are kind of the highest paid profession compared to what you can get elsewhere, especially for the same amount of training and, and experience. Um, so basically by having that flexible ledger, there's this constant year after year after year kind of siphoning of value from some to others uh, based on access to credit, based on those who hold assets, those are able to uh, long-term leverage those assets uh, in moderate ways to kind of continue siphoning um, that, that resource and then are able to make sure that they're built out during a crisis uh, mm -hmm. faster or more thoroughly than others. Uh, that's probably the number one reason I'd argue. Uh, and that's why you see it in a lot of different places. I think a secondary thing is, um, you know, it gets less headlines, uh, people, because people like the shock value of, you know, look what they did to us or look, look what's happening. But I think a secondary reason is just that the United States in the 1970s and before was kind of unsustainably good in the sense that most of the rest of the world was still wrecked, uh, either by World War II or by communism. And when the rest of the world caught up, it was natural that some of that was going to, to spread elsewhere, right? And so the rise of China, for example, back up to where it historically has been a, a leading world power uh, did kind of take away some from the United States middle class. And I think some some degree of that was probably inevitable because some degree of that was inherently temporary. Um, mm -hmm. But I but the fact that it didn't happen to the whole developed world equally, I think is basically a matter of in what ways were their flexible ledgers manipulated? Some, sometimes there's a culture that prevent or slows down how much is manipulated in favor mm -hmm. of the wealthy and other ones, uh, it just, it just more readily goes straight to the top.
It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners. First up, Bitcoin Amsterdam. The biggest Bitcoin conference in Europe is just around the corner. The second annual event will be held October 12th and 13th and bring together speakers from around the world, including the one and only Edward Snowden, Stella Assange, Balaji, Eva Vlardingerbroek, and so many more. Get your tickets with a 10% discount using code HODL. And don't forget to get your early bird pass to Bitcoin Nashville 2024. You're going to get the best price right now. And again, use code HODL for that discount. I'll see you there. Next up, Fold. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase from Amazon to groceries to your Bitcoin conference ticket with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card. And you can play to win free Satoshis or even a whole Bitcoin by spinning the rewards wheel. Head to foldapp.com slash Natalie and you'll get 10,000 Satoshis when you sign up for Spin or Spin Plus and spend at least $20 on the card. All right, back to the show. I want to dig into some of that because in 1971, not only did we decouple from gold, but that was the decade of the petrodollar. And I loved your chapter about heavy is the head who wears the, wears the crown because this idea that like we must remain the global reserve currency. You are so thoughtful in painting the picture of actually a, a bright future in a multipolar world that we don't have to hold on to this America, the empire, which has actually caused the hollowing out of the middle class and and so many of the negative financial effects that we felt, including the financialization that you talked about, where everyone's now investing and risking as opposed to saving. Um, can you can you talk a little bit more about that? First of all, one thing that I wondered when I was reading your book is. Why did the world go along with it when we decoupled from gold and, and the U.S. was still the global reserve currency now backed essentially by by debt? Why did the world go along with it? Um, and can you kind of kind of explain why the middle class and the industrial base was so hollowed out because of these arrangements that we made that artificially strengthened the dollar? Sure. So. What's interesting, I think when, when you think about what's good for America or what's bad for America, we have to realize that there are multiple Americas, right? So what's good for Wall Street could be different than what's good for an automaker in Detroit, for example. Um, and there's a million examples like that. So in general, most of the policy uh, under the petrodollar system has been good for kind of the governing class. So if, if you're near DC, if you're near the financial center in New York, uh, certain other high margin industries like tech or healthcare, that's been where this has been successful. Uh, basically, the, the approach has been tailored towards um, having a strong global reach uh, and uh, an approach that's very kind of good for those with assets, uh, but it's not necessarily been good for those who want to make things or, or those who basically work for a living uh, that actually kind of earn money based on their hourly uh, rate of you know, doing work every day. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why you know, the way I would phrase it is that there's a big cost to maintaining the system and that you're, you're, you're draining some resource from the broader economy in order to maintain that. So under the Bretton Woods system, the resource that was being drained was the gold reserves because you had proliferating dollars due to fractional reserve banking and it was pegged to gold, even though banks themselves had no reason to slow down lending because they weren't the ones holding the gold. Um, so you had a, you, you, by just by damaging the incentives, um, we drained our gold reserves until that system ended. Uh, so, and then under the current system, the resource we drain is generally our industrial base, our industrial competitiveness. So as we add this kind of extra strength to our currency by maintaining the network effect and by maintaining global demand for it, um, it makes it so that if you're a lower margin business, if you're a, you know, more of a manufacturing style business, you're generally going to have an artificial disadvantage placed on you if you're in the United States compared to if you're in many other parts of the world. Um, and so that's kind of been the framework. Now, why people went along with it, um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that money is a network effect good. Um, and so at the time in, in the 1970s and arguably still today, there would there was no money better than the dollar, right? So the the only you know alternative before then was was gold really, but gold was too slow. So gold was a useful savings asset, but not a useful money in the telecommunication era. Right. It had to be abstracted in some way, and abstraction means centralization and pegs can be broken, things like that. And so they all were able to use what was the biggest ledger, which was the American Central Bank. And they said, okay, we're all going to have our own little currency bubbles. And we're going to tie ourselves together with that that glue, uh, which is that that flexible, very fast ledger. 
Um, and there's been multiple attempts uh, from places to try to diversify away from it. So that was one of the original um, goals of the euro was to basically, you know, be an alternative to the dollar. Uh, it, it's been partially successful in the sense that Europe's been able to buy some of their energy, for example, in euros. Um, it, it's had some advantages, but it's had a lot of disadvantages and it's come nowhere close to realistically competing with the dollar as the global reserve currency. Uh, and so I would argue that basically because money kind of trends towards one and because it trends towards network effects, uh, it's, it was, it's been very hard for other countries to do anything about this arrangement. Um, and one of the, I think the, the, the damaging outcomes of this environment is that countries never emerge. They're always emerging, but they never emerge. Um, you know, you can count on one hand out of countless developing countries in the past 50 years that I've went from developing country status to developed country status. Uh, so Singapore did, um, uh, South Korea did, um, and, and uh, you know, Taiwan did. Uh, basically, there are a handful of examples in Asia that did, and virtually no, nowhere else. There's no, uh, you know, none of the countries in Latin America developed really. Some of them actually de-developed during that era. Um, no countries in Africa did. And most countries in Asia didn't either. You didn't, you, basically it's been this trap where they're always stuck in a treadmill of emerging but never having emerged. And I would argue a big chunk of that is it's very hard for them to build domestic capital, liquid capital. So mm -hmm. by being reliant on this external unit of account that you know can be hardened against them in some time so it can make all their debt harder to repay, or if they save their money in dollars and then the United States decides to print a lot, their savings can be devalued. So what? What benefits a creditor nation versus what benefits a debtor nation can vary over time. It's very hard for these countries to build uh, capital, whereas most of the countries that we consider developed today became developed uh, on harder money standards. Basically, when money was precious metals, they became developed, and they're kind of these permanent winners in, in this current environment where if you're not in that club, if you're not in the club that developed under a prior monetary system, it's very hard to develop today. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I was so naive in the past before reading your work and the work of Alex Gladstein, um, just about how oppressive uh, the the system with the World Bank and the IMF are with these high interest loans that they, they can never pay back and how much corruption there is with the authoritarian governments. And so people are really enslaved and they lose their natural resources and can never build real wealth. And meanwhile, it's siphoned off and it goes to the countries that already have the wealth. And I think so many people are just completely unaware of that because I think that they would be very against those policies. Um, so how do you see, um, I mean, the the folks out there who now there's this narrative uh, that's propping up again. I know I know you've talked about it existing in past decades, but this idea that the dollar is is dying, you know, other countries are, are, are moving to different currencies, they're selling off their treasuries. I think that's going to be a lot slower of a process than, than some, some analysts out there are predicting. But what do you say to the Americans that are fearful of a multipolar world? And, and I, I sometimes hear it in the rhetoric of even our presidential candidates that we need to keep America as the superpower. We have to maintain dollar dominance and, and this is how to move forward. But as you've said in your book, we are moving toward a more multipolar world, world and that's not a bad thing. Yeah, I think and that's that's one of those things where it's easier to make sound bites and it's harder to argue the 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 you know the more complex case. You, you know, once you start going into America, the empire versus America, the country, or how yeah. there's different Americas, it's inherently a long answer. Uh, yeah. Whereas the idea of basically that a strong dollar or a you know an artificially strong dollar with a network effect globally is good for Americans is a is a it seems intuitively right and it's shorter to say and so people just naturally believe that whereas you know a lot of the issues that we have in the United States basically the structural trade deficit uh, which harms some of us but not all of us uh, was really born in this current monetary era in, ever since the 1970s. Uh, and a lot of that, again, has to do with the fact that the way the system has to work is if the whole world is going to use dollars, the United States has to supply them with dollars. And the way that the, the mechanism for which that works is a trade deficit. Basically, our imports are artificially strengthened because our currency is artificially strong and our exports are made less competitive because, again, our, our, 
you know, our, our currency is not um, kind of balancing itself naturally around the trade balance. It's being held up in other ways because there's, there's forces on the dollar that are different than forces on most countries' currencies. Uh, basically, any time a country has dollar-dominated debt, that represents demand for dollars. They have to service that debt. And so by having decades of network effects uh, and by being the, the most you know, liquid one, the biggest one out there, there's all of this extra demand for it, this extra monetary premium, which is really good if you're in the United States and you're not trying to make anything. If you work mm-hmm. in DC, if you work in New York, if you work in tech or healthcare, uh, it's pretty good for you because you have a strong dollar and you're not really getting the downsides of that. Whereas if you're in the working class or the middle class, uh, it's more of a mixed bag and often more of a, on the negative side of things. Uh, generally what you see with countries is that whenever they have a policy of currency manipulation, whether they're manipulating it to be artificially strong or artificially weak, that tends to cause issues because it's, it's overriding some natural market force. So the al- alternative situation to the dollar would be mercantilism, which is where a country will purposely try to maximize its exports and reduce its imports. And what they do is they constantly devalue their currency by accumulating reserve assets. And so they're basically trying to make it so that the workers in that country are not the ones accumulating the benefits. Uh, instead, the, the value is kind of flowing up to the top towards the central bank, towards the government, towards the, you know, for lack of a better word, the elites. Uh, and they're basically making it so that their labor pool remains competitive even as they develop. Right. So whether whether a currency is being made stronger than it should be based on a trade balance or whether it's being made more negative than it should be based on a trade balance, usually it means that someone's paying the price for that. You know, some some groups being benefited from that manipulation and another group is is, you know, hurting from it. Uh, And I would say that's the case for the dollar. That's kind of the short case for why this is the case. Uh, But the longer one, that's probably why I wrote a book, is that some of these arguments are hard to make on Twitter, hard to make on even like a long article. And sometimes you have to sit down and just spell out the entire case. And, and, you know, it's like certain information needs preceding information for that to make sense in context. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's, that's why I decided to write a book, which is, which is basically that, you know, no one should ever write a book for the sake of making money because it's not a very good time to money ratio usually. Instead, it's when you have an idea that you feel can only be expressed in very long form. Um, there's there's plenty of things that can be expressed in shorter form, but if you find yourself in a situation where the person needs to know like these eight things before this ninth thing can make sense, it's best to then put that all in, a, in order and kind of walk them through that because things can click for them that can't click from an article or a tweet thread. Well, it's such a good point because so many folks out there that are listening to these sound bites and think they're good ideas, they don't have that extra context and they don't understand the nuances. Um, so they're almost voting for things that really are going to hurt them in the long run and certainly have. Um, one thing that I've always had a hard time following is the discussions um, about whether QE exacerbates or contributes to wealth inequality. Because I kind of always assume, well, yeah, I mean, they're monetizing the debt and the debt is flowing to assets. And now we see asset inflation. A lot of Americans don't own assets. And so, of course, it is. But again, there's nuance in that conversation as well. Um, did, did writing this book help you flush those out, the, those ideas out as well? Yeah, that's something I explored in um, an article a while back. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something I might go into in, in other pieces too. That wasn't a, a core subject of the book. Um, but the way I would describe that is, you know, if if we start with the thesis that QE is, uh, you know, concentrates wealth, then what we should see when looking out is that countries that have done more QE relative to their economic size, like let's say their GDP, should have more wealth concentration. We should see a pretty... Um, uh, linear relationship in that regard. And instead, we don't. We actually see that there's either little correlation or sometimes a slight inverse correlation. So for example, Japan did far more yeah, QE yeah. than the United States did, and Japan has less wealth concentration. So the, then the question becomes, you know, why? And the way I would describe it is QE makes government spending more flexible, but then it depends on how that government spends the money, right? So in Japan's case, they don't spend a lot of the military. Uh, they have uh, inexpensive, effective healthcare, uh, you know, despite being an, an older population. Um, and there's just not a lot of wealth siphoning that's being spent from the fiscal authority. So the fact that they have a super flexible ledger is not kind of actively being used against the, the, 
typical person in the Japanese middle class in the same way that in the United States, whenever there's a crisis, we bail out the banks. We don't bail out like the homeowners, for example, right? It's every single time we always kind of find a way to siphon value towards the top. Or in this, in this recent crisis, we say, okay, you get a stimulus check. Uh, but if you're running a, you know, a small business and you're like a law firm and you're doing fine, you can get a PPP loan for like half a million dollars. And that just goes straight to the the owner, basically, right? So so, so some people got five hundred thousand dollars stimulus checks, and other people got like five thousand worth of stimulus checks, childcare tax credits, that kind of thing. And so the United States always finds ways to use the flexible ledger to kind of siphon value up, whereas you see that a little bit less in Europe or Japan. But of course, they have other issues. I mean, they've they've been, uh, you know, their their overall economic situation has been relatively stagnant for the past you know, 15, 20 years, in Japan's case, 30 years, some of that's demographics. Um, and so it's one of, another one of those things where the sound bite is easier to say, but then the full description of what's actually happening under the hood takes time to deconstruct. And basically the short answer is that QE's relationship with wealth concentration is more complex than merely more QE means more wealth concentration. It just means that the government spending is more flexible, which is gonna vary country by country, depending on who, who they're favoring with that government spending. Right. Yeah. To your earlier point, that's the reason why assets have gotten so much more expensive, especially for Americans. Um, okay. So let's turn a little bit to to Bitcoin. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk to you about is credit and, and Bitcoin, because um, we live in a world of, of credit and people take out mortgages and they have student loan loans. But uh, Bitcoin represents this ability to have this rule-based monetary system that is it has settlement, instant settlement, um, but you still see a world of credit being built on top of that. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how that would work? Um, because I, I know I watched a, an interview recently with George Gammon and uh, Peter and Jeff Booth, and one one of the main discussion topics was this idea that oh, people will always want to take out loans, but in a world of Bitcoin, hard money that is continuing to appreciate where people can actually save as opposed to needing to invest the way they do today. Um, won't there be less, you know, need for going into debt? Yeah. One thing I argue in the book is that there's like a bell curve around um, currency strength and debt levels. Uh, and so if you have a very weak currency, like the Argentine peso, there are a few lenders that want to lend in that currency for long periods of time because they, they have no idea what their payback is going to be. Um, on the other hand, if you have very hard money, um, you get a lot less borrowing desire because fewer people want to borrow for long durations in a very scarce unit. Uh, and so the, the maximal leverage we tend to see is in these, the middle of the road, like, like modern developed countries where they have a gradually debasing unit, uh, but one where both you know, lenders can have reasonable visibility on their long-term payback terms and borrowers are still incentivized to borrow it relative to scarcer assets like business equity or, or household equity and things like that. So that's how we get this kind of maximally leveraged situation, which over decades then feeds into instability. Uh, so if we look at Bitcoin, uh, you know, Bitcoin would be the scarcest monetary unit in the sense that it has zero terminal supply inflation, uh, whereas gold uh, has an average of 1.5% supply inflation. And back in the 1800s was somewhat faster than that because you, they had new continents to you know, access deposits in that were previously untapped. Uh, and so overall, you have a, uh, a less um, inflationary unit, which further disincentivizes borrowing in it. And the fact that it moves around very quickly makes it so that it's very dangerous to build fractions or banks on it. Um, you would either need extremely high liquidity ratios or you need to be just flat out full reserve, which means that you're locking in capital, your, your duration matching your liabilities and your assets. You're basically you're not rehypothecating the capital. You're not double counting it. Um, and so I think in a Bitcoin world, there would still be credit, uh, but only for highly productive purposes. I, I think we can think of debt as there's two main types of debt. There's debt that's being used for something very productive, and then there's debt whose primary purpose is to short the currency. Mm -hmm. um, and so an example of the latter is that, you know, Coca-Cola has debt, right? So this is like a, a, you know, a very successful century old business. Why do they have debt? And the answer is they choose to have debt as a permanent part of their capital structure because what they're basically doing is shorting the dollar. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, if they can borrow at 2%, 
Uh, now they can't, but you know, back in when interest rates were low, they could borrow super low. They could borrow at a rate that was way below the supply of money. Uh, and that was a cheaper source for them than equity. Uh, and they could lock it in for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And you, so c- corporations did that all the time. Same thing if you're a homeowner and you can borrow very cheaply at 30 years, uh, that's been a key way to build wealth. And it protects you from the, you know, over time as the money supply keeps growing, as your house goes up, you know, your, your taxes on that house are going to be bigger over time. But if you have this like low fixed rate mortgage, you basically have shorted the currency the whole time. And so those types of long-term unproductive debt don't make sense if you're denominating something in gold, let alone Bitcoin, which is even more scarce. Uh, so that type of debt doesn't make any economic sense in that, in that world. Whereas if someone's say buying a house with a five-year term, or uh, is using their house for a little bit of collateral for some, some other reason, or if someone wishes to get an education in a very kind of um, in a way that's very likely to increase their income, uh, you know, shorter duration or liquidity providing types of credit would still make sense, um, but the overall debt levels would have to be much lower and it would be incentivized to be much lower because it'd be foolish in most cases to to borrow Bitcoin long term, and then also. Any entity that's providing those loans has to make sure that they have the capital, which generally means full reserve banking, like a lack of rehypothecation. It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Next up, CoinKite, which offers everything you need to safely take custody of your Bitcoin. CoinKite produces the cold card wallet, which is the cold storage device I use for safekeeping my Bitcoin. You can verify the source code. It's ultra secure and it's easy to use, even if you're a beginner. Head to their website in my show notes to find all of their custody products and you'll get a 5% discount with my link. Become your own bank with Bitcoin and CoinKite. Next up, I want to share with you about CrowdHealth. Health insurance costs are sky high today, and you send your money every month to a fiat corporation only to never see that money again, even if you don't get sick. But if you do need care, you end up having to pay even more out of pocket. But luckily, there's an alternative, and it's all about community. Crowd Health brings together Bitcoiners who crowdfund each other's healthcare. So how it works is when you need a doctor or hospital visit, Crowd Health negotiates down the medical bill lower than what insurance would be, and the community helps you cover the costs. You get to save the money you would have sent to an insurance company. And hey, why not put it into Bitcoin? To sign up, head to joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie. All right, next up, I'm excited to share that I am an advisor for the Orange Pill app. If you haven't downloaded this app yet, then you're missing out on connecting with Bitcoiners in your area. The Orange Pill app is focused on building the social layer for Bitcoin and helping create opportunities for in-person connections and community building. Come join us and use the referral link in my show notes to start connecting today. You know, you're you're raising something that I've been thinking about recently, just with the worker strikes that are happening. Just how how much a lot of these corporations are in debt. We have so many zombie companies, and we've really normalized all of it. But you know, Lynn, am am I wrong to understand the situation as basically, you know, these companies? They had low interest rates for a long time. They took out debt instead of investing in, you know, the workers or productive infrastructure, technology. A lot of it went to share buybacks, which pump up the, you know, the executive salary compensation packages. And all of a sudden, after a couple of decades, you literally have workers that are making 300 times less than their CEOs. And it's almost not surprising to see that they're super frustrated. They're demanding these raises. Meanwhile, the company, um, you know, has been has been taking out a ton of debt and their costs are also going up, especially when it comes to energy. Uh, And so they're they're, you know, coming back saying we can't raise wages. I mean, where, where's the nuance in that? Because it, it can get so confusing. It's like I see both sides. I think the nuance is that inflation is hard to measure. And that's one of the kind of dangerous aspects for how money dilution works. Um, and so if you have a country with, say, 7% long-term money supply growth per year, which is the case for like the average developed country, mm-hmm. um, if you look at super scarce things, like literally finite things like waterfront property or um famous like artist paintings right like, that they're not making more of because they're they're deceased um those things tend to go up in price roughly in line with the money supply growth now there might be mm-hmm. local bubbles or crashes but generally over a multi-decade period that's that's roughly the rate that they tend to appreciate at um when you look at things that are a little bit less scarce but they're they're still either labor intensive energy intensive or otherwise you know kind of desirable things like oil beef gold 
uh, the median house, right? These things tend to go up at a rate that is higher than CPI, but lower than money supply growth, because we're getting more, we're, we're able to inflate their supply, just not as quickly. And so, uh, and it is energy intensive to do so. So those things tend to go up quicker. And then the CPI calculation itself is held down by the long tail of things that we get way better at making, like electronic storage, for example, mm -hmm. we get a thousand times better at making it. So the price goes down a thousand fold or the cost of taking a picture and storing the picture, um, software, apparel, um, you know, industrialized goods, things like that, grains. Um, and so we get way better at making kind of lower, like less energy intensive things or things that are greatly impacted by technology or offshoring. And so when you put that into a CPI basket, you get something like 3% average inflation, but the basket for like the American dream life uh, is actually more like four or 5%. It's kind of in that second category of relatively labor intensive and energy intensive things. So a nice house, good healthcare, uh, you know, education, like high quality education, uh, uh, good travel, for example, the ba uh, nutritious uh, food, mm -hmm. the basket of that stuff goes up on average faster than CPI. And so the problem is that when you have a constantly diluting monetary environment, it's hard for people to know what they should be benchmarking against. They think they're benchmarking against CPI, whereas they're really benchmarking against a scarcer basket that's higher than CPI. Uh, or another way of looking at it is like, you can look at money supply per capita, for example, you're saying, okay, I, I at least want to keep up my share of this, this growing pie. And the, the problem with the constant inflation is that the, the onus is always on the worker to try to negotiate raises to keep up with inflation. Right. Um, and so if, if, you know, inflation is average 3% per year, but the real inflation rate, like for actually the, the high quality life is four or 5%, um, the person has to try to negotiate, like say a 6% rate raise because they're saying, okay, well, if, if true inflation is 5%, I want 5% plus I got a little bit more experience and productive this year. Uh, and so I want a 1% real raise. Uh, but the employer just sees 6% and says, that's, that's ridiculous. Why are you not 6% better than you were last year? Whereas really the, the person just saying that 5% of that was dilution. And you see this more in developing countries. Like for, I mm -hmm. use Egypt as an example. They just cut their currency in half relative to the dollar at the behest of the IMF in order to get a loan to kind of keep their external debt in order. And if you go around and ask how many Egyptians got 100% raises to, to, to offset that, the answer is almost none. It, it basically, unless you're like, you know, an elite, like a celebrity or like you're, you're top, basically the top 1%, if you're like so in demand, you can maybe figure that out. But the, the you know, the 90 some percent of people can't do that. Uh, and so they are now making less uh, in a dollar dominated way going forward. So it's not just their savings that were diluted, it's their ongoing income streams that were diluted and it's opaque and it's hard for them to know what the number should have been. For example, in Egypt's case, the money supply grows at about 20% per year. And that's generally what you'll see in developing countries, which is it's faster money supply growth than we have in developed countries. And so all those things I just mentioned are amplified. So the long story short, is that American workers have faced two main problems. One was that the conditions of the 50s and 60s were, like I said before, somewhat artificially good uh, because we were, the rest of the world was either bombed or trying out communism. And so like we almost had no competition. Whereas once we had competition come back, it kind of spread out those gains somewhat. So that that's where workers got arbitraged. Um, but then also it's, it's the fact that when you have constant inflation, it's very easy to slowly siphon income from workers and have it go towards the top, especially if you're an asset owner that then has access to very cheap credit and you keep shorting that, that unit. So rich people are shorting the unit and workers are trying to earn that unit. So that, that's generally how this kind of overall wealth siphoning happens. It's so, it's so fascinating. And it, most people don't understand and they're turning to politics and populism, which, which you talked about too. Um, one, one theme that I found really interesting throughout your book is that because of the evolution of technology and you have to, you know, have a baby step before you can run, you sort of say that some of these things were inevitable, right? And because of the limitations of gold, um, we sort of would have ended up in this place no matter how you sliced it. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and, and how you see Bitcoin as almost inevitable? Sure. So I, I view basically that, you know, once the telegraph was invented, um, that allowed for rapid transmission of data. Um, but transactions require a lot less data 
than settlements. So it's easy to, you know, with more something as simple as Morse code, you can do a transaction with someone. Whereas, you know, digital settlement or fast global settlement requires something like Bitcoin, which, you know, if you look at what Bitcoin requires, uh, it requires much more complex uh, math, much more complex processors, much more complex um, telecommunication systems. I mean, the internet, which didn't exist back then, but then not even just the internet, you need relatively high bandwidth uh, ways of transmitting data to, to have the kind of the throughput we have today with Bitcoin. Uh, and then you need certain encryption methods that, you know, the, the latest encryption method that Bitcoin uses wasn't invented or released until like 2001, right? So it's kind of like Bitcoin came almost as quickly as it could have based on the, the bandwidth, the processing, the encryption methods that all kind of came together. So I would argue that it's inevitable that something like the telegraph would come way before Bitcoin. And because that happens, that creates this window, which in our case was a century and a half. Maybe if there's alien races, maybe they maybe they had a shorter window, maybe they have a longer window, but that window is going to exist. And in that window, it greatly amplifies the power of those that run money, right? Because now you necessitate mm -hmm. abstraction. If you can transfer value, if you can make transactions very quickly, but you can't settle gold very quickly, um, then those who are keeping the ledgers and running things are basically have a monopoly status now. Uh, and a, a government you know, has trouble enforcing rules on all of its individuals, but it can easily enforce rules on a handful of banks. Um, basically it's, it's a thousand fold less entities to go after. You can say all banks have to do this rule. Um, and so governments are able to centralize their banking systems and basically have a monopoly. And that's how we end up in this world of 160 different fiat currencies, which are all these, these little bubbles and then outside of the top 10 currencies or so, currency is not really accepted anywhere else. So for example, Thai bot, Egyptian pounds, even, even currencies of wealthy countries like, the, like Norway, if I go around in New Jersey trying to spend Norway physical currency, right. it's actually gonna be quite challenging to get that off my hands. The saleability is extremely low mm -hmm. outside of its own country and maybe a couple neighboring countries. Um, and so we've been in this environment where technology the, the order that it had to happen in, um, mm. and for quite a while, has put us in this kind of local maximum. And, you know, the invention of Bitcoin is the first credible way to end that era. We've, we've now, after another century and a half from the telegraph, we now have digital settlements. So we can, we have a ledger that is decentralized rather than centralized, and you can send bare asset final settlement around. So it's not based on debt. It's not based on credit. It's not based on an IOU. It's actually just finally um settled through the software mm -hmm. logic and control and that is you know it was inevitable that bitcoin would happen now the question is is, is it inevitable that bitcoin wins right mm -hmm. i can picture a world where say the, the person who figured out bitcoin was like a scammer right imagine if someone was as smart as satoshi but they gave themselves a pre-mine or something right. or or spent their coins or just had a terrible mm -hmm. personality never disappeared and revealed who they were and you know, I can imagine a world where the second currency instead kind of overtakes the first one, right? Mm -hmm. If the first one was kind of launched poorly. Um, but I think in some way, it's, it's, this is now a technology that exists. We're fortunate that Bitcoin was the first one rather than kind of a scammy one being first. Um, that allowed the, the network effect to accumulate on a good system uh, without having to be disrupted, hopefully. And so we have this, this is like the first real shot to get out of the century and a half window we've been in. Um, and so I think it's important to keep analyzing risks, things that could prevent that. Uh, and I think it's important for people to do what they can to support that system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's important for companies to build on it. I think it's important for people to, um, you know, talk about it. Uh, they can they can let their politicians know that they're in favor of it. There's all sorts of little things that people can do around the margins that mm -hmm. give Bitcoin the breathing room it needs to get out of its like you know child state and into you know the more large and liquid and secure it gets, the, the better shot it has that this is actually going to continue taking off. Um, and so that's that's one thing I approach differently than other people is a lot of people approach like a moral argument against central banking. Whereas I say the fact that it exists everywhere is something more than just morals. It's, it's some sort of technology, some mm -hmm. sort of conditions that allow that to basically uniformly emerge everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what what state of affairs would disincentivize that behavior? What would make that no longer the best model of doing things? And I would argue that something like Bitcoin is is really the only visible thing I see on the horizon um, that has a shot of disrupting 
that century and a half. That's so interesting. You know, Lynn, I want to ask you because gold's limitation was was its speed because it's so it's physical and not as portable and there are high fees in transporting it. So is there any similarity between gold speed limitations and maybe in a future where I've been hearing that some folks don't believe that everyone will be able to transact on the base layer with Bitcoin because it'll be too expensive. So you have to build on layers on top of it. But does that pose any risk of something emerging that is more like paper Bitcoin or, um, you know, creating trying to force some sort of centralization because it's simply inaccessible to the average person to actually transact on the base layer? I mean, I think it's one of those things that it's a good discussion to have. Um, I think the fact that Bitcoin is hard to change by design uh, is a good thing. And so even some things that are maybe improvements to Bitcoin, you know, most things are trade-offs. Um, like they, they make one variable better, they make one variable worse. Other ones could be strict improvements. Like we get better encryption methods, we get, you know, more sophisticated software techniques. There are direct improvements that can be done. But it's a good thing that those are hard to add to the network. It basically, you know, miners and and nodes both have varying degrees of power in in terms of forcing those those types of changes. Um, I think it is a long term risk that not everyone like the Bitcoin's throughput is limited. Um, but I don't think it's the same thing that happened with gold. So the problem with gold is that gold itself was so slow that you had to abstract it to keep up in the telecommunications age. So even in 1875, which was, you know, the, the telegraph had only been around for a, f a few decades in Europe, and the, the first cross-Atlantic one was only put in place in the late um, 1860s. And so this was like a decade after, you know, kind of the whole Western world was connected with telegraph. And you already had a situation where there were like 20 claims for gold for every ounce of gold in the system. Uh, and, the you know, basically the, the author of that book uh, in 1875, Jevons, was both excitedly explaining how efficient the system has become, that you barely ever need to use gold anymore, but he's also warning that this, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that this, this leverage because of that is is yeah. very dangerous. And so we have to never forget that all of these claims are redeemable for gold, should that happen. Um, with Bitcoin, I don't really see that type of risk manifesting that you need to fully abstract it. But instead, I think it is going to be the, the case that either there's going to be a lot of custodial environments for Bitcoin, um, or there's going to be federations and things like that. I think people underestimate the tool set that we have available in Bitcoin that is a, a noticeable improvement compared to what we had before. Because, for example, you can have a custodian that is federated and that the, you know, the key signers are in multiple different countries, for mm -hmm. example. That's something you can't do with, with a gold custodian. Um, you can also have, you know, with Chalmin Mints, which is like 40 year old technology that never really found a home until Bitcoin potentially kind of revives it. Um, that allows a custodian to custody someone's funds without even knowing the details um, of who they're cust custodying for, what they're paying, how much they have, things like that. So you can get private custodianship, which is hard or impossible in most other types of physical systems. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that there are, even with Bitcoin's constrained base layer, there still are a lot of improvements um, kind of that are possible in these higher layers. And then I don't think we should rule out the potential for soft forks like covenants or things like that that can improve access to the base layer uh, without, you know, kind of risking decentralization that you would get if you were in favor of say block size increases, right? They, we've already kind of gone down that route. Um, I, I do think that there are covenants or you know, potentially zero knowledge proofs or something. We'll see what happens. I don't think there's a rush for it because there's only so much demand for base layer block space to begin with. Right. Um, but as, as say we, if we have an environment where Bitcoin's kind of persistently used by 10x more people and high fees become a more persistent thing, um, that could change incentives a little bit uh, yeah. towards a fork that, that maybe finds an efficiency uh, to, to strictly improve it rather than, you know, you know, improve it in one way, but hurt the decentralization in another way. So I, I'm still generally mm -hmm. optimistic, but even if Bitcoin just stays the way it is, I I think people are sometimes too negative on custody because you still can have custody that is um, more decentralized or more mm -hmm. secure than you have and quicker and kind of backed up by software, like, you know, rather than purely credit. 
Yeah. Now, I really appreciate how thoughtful you are when when talking about the future of Bitcoin, because you're obviously very hopeful, but you're also realistic about some of the risks, which you talk about in your book. Um, I gave you a shout out because I was interviewing Kathy Wood, and uh, and I, I've just learned so much from you about distinguishing the real differences between the other cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. And um, you wrote about the difference between proof of work and proof of stake, which I, I really think everyone out there needs to read. And I wanted to ask you, Lynn, because, um, you know, I have a lot of crypto people who follow me. And recently there was like that big conference, I think it was in uh, Singapore, and you have these big names and very smart people, business leaders who are out there and they really believe in crypto and and i constantly find myself just saying like what am i missing what am i missing because when i listen to the maximalists i think they're they're totally right and uh and then i see all these folks out there who are um you know they're they're, they're not dumb people and they're really advocating for these different applications to the technology um so what do you say to the folks out there because i have both right i have the hardcore maxis and i i Feel like i fall in that category and then i have the crypto folks out there who see a world where there's going to be a ton of different tokens and DeFi and all of that and you really spell out that there's a big difference one one can be a monetary system and the others are maybe interesting technologies at best yeah i think there's a couple ways to approach that one would be that when you see a lot of smart people into crypto a lot of it is because they themselves can benefit from it they, they, you know, they're the ones that are kind of issuing tokens and then basically being able to sell them before they've actually built a product. So one of the big challenges in the crypto space is that if you look at traditional venture capital, uh, you know, accredited investors or, or, or founders of companies themselves are locking up their equity for many years in most cases. And their only realistic way to, to get out from, from that situation is either the company is successful enough to go public and they can begin selling shares or... Um, the company gets acquired by another business. So basically a, a bunch of professional analysts are assessing this business and decide to acquire it and bring it in part of their business. And so the outcome of that investment is largely tied to the success of the company that they've built. Whereas in crypto, you've removed the gatekeeper, uh, but that the incentive there is that you, you can sell the tokens to the public before you've actually proven the long-term viability of the project. So the founders can get rich either way, uh, whether or not the project's successful. So there are plenty of smart people that say, well, I want to get a piece of that, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, intelligence doesn't always come with ethics or, you know, they'll make arguments. Well, you know, I, I, I sold something that was the market price and, mm -hmm. you know, I walked away rich, even though I didn't build anything, right? And so uh, I think that's the biggest risk. I, you know, when you look at um, the, when we remove the gatekeepers of like music and books, right? So by making yeah. it so that people can self-publish easier, uh, either their music or videos or books. The good news is that by removing the gatekeepers, you decentralize it. But at the same time, we as consumers, we come to expect that there's a long tail of really bad stuff, right? Because there's no, it doesn't have to get through like a filter. It can just get out there. And we as consumers learn to navigate th that fact that, that it's good that everyone can publish, but that means there's going to be more bad books. Mm -hmm. um, and with crypto, it's basically peer-to-peer -peer securities. Um, so Bitcoin's peer-to-peer -peer money. And with crypto, you generally get peer-to-peer -peer securities. And I think, you know, from the, say, the libertarian perspective, you can argue it's good that the gatekeepers are down, that, that people can, get, this is another type of market behavior that people can, can navigate. But mm -hmm. I think that what we have to do as consumers is build up that experience that because it's, because those gatekeepers are down, the long tail of almost everything is going to be trash, right? And that there's way more ways for VCs and founders and just to create things and keep dumping them out there. And I yeah. think there has to be there has to be a number of cycles of people learning to defend against that. Um, so I can see why these founders are interested in it. I, I think, and from a from a consumer perspective, there's always kind of the desire to get rich that they're that they're going to yeah. be the one that gets the you know buys the next big thing and then gets out towards the top. And, you know, obviously for every one person that does that, there are like 99 that, that don't do that. Um, the other thing I, I think I'd point out is that it's been, you know, almost 15 years um, since, since Bitcoin was released, um, about 15 years since it was proposed. Um, and the use case for things that are not money in the broad crypto space are almost nothing. Right. So there's Bitcoin, 
uh, there's stable coins that that's been the most effective kind of crypto technology uh, outside of Bitcoin uh, in terms of market cap volumes, uh, actually solving a, a problem for people in the real world. It, it's basically another way for an Argentinian to get dollars, for example. Um, outside of those monetary use cases, most everything else kind of comes in waves and then dies down and then comes in another wave and dies down and comes in another wave and dies down. And then we look at the whole space and say, what has created more value? All of that or like one company like Kickstarter, for example, that, that allows kind of people to get capital and release a product and, and things like that, right? So I would argue that the fact that very little utility is actually emerging from the space that's not money is increasing evidence that it's not what a lot of the crypto proponents would argue that it is. Um, I, I still think in general, the stablecoin model of applying that to other types of assets. So if, you, if an Argentinian can own dollar, why can't they also own a share of Apple stock if they want to, right? So maybe maybe tokenizing actually real world businesses could make sense. But again, the even if that's the case, the market cap of that idea, basically the tech drills that enable that are limited. Right. If you if you look at the total value of all stock exchanges today, for example, I mean, it's worth tens and hundreds of billions of dollars, but it's not worth like 10 trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. um, you're just you're just the middleman. And so, you know, tech providers or exchange providers, things like that, there might be certain markets for that type of thing to, to make certain types of assets more divisible or more globally accepted. Yeah. Um, but I think that that's that's just a much smaller idea than investing in a new base layer of money. Right. So. I, I generally say that I don't really have a strong view on what that might be used for, but the investment landscape of, for that is just so fraught with landmines that I, I just find just Bitcoin to be way more interesting. Yeah, it was really interesting when you, you talked about this idea of you know, the stock market is only open, what, nine to four, and uh, it's certainly not accessible to everyone around the world the way that the, a digital property like Bitcoin is. Um, and obviously there are a lot of ideas that, may or may not work in that space. But with regard to stable coins, what do you see as the future? Because I feel like the regulators are, you know, they don't want a non-KYC dollar floating out there that they have no control over. So how do you think that the forces of sort of control versus the forces of freedom will play out? Because there has been such a use case for stable coins around the world, especially in countries where their currencies are failing. Yeah, I think when you look globally, a lot of people want dollars, but it's hard for them to get them. Um, you know, I know people in Egypt literally hold physical cash dollars um, as a way of saving, so they get no interest on it. Um, they're at risk of theft or, or loss, um, but they kind of surveilled the landscape and said, that's my best bet for the next few years of holding value. Um, and so digital dollars gives another way of accessing that for places where it's either hard or expensive to get physical dollars. Um, and so we see that that's pretty popular in a lot of developing countries, uh, stable coins. Um, the biggest risk I generally see is that while, you know, the way I would describe stable coins is that it's centralized, but the hub is not in those countries. So if you're an Argentinian, for example, you're not worried about the Argentinian government shutting down a, a stable coin. Uh, but but the, I think the long term threat is that the United States does have the power to shut down or heavily disrupt um, these types of stablecoin providers. Mm -hmm. And whether or not they will, I think, is a question of, of like who is in charge, because in any sort of government, it's, it's quite complex. It's not a monolith. It's not like the government thinks this or the government thinks that. Um, for example, there are people in the government that want to reduce um, Bitcoin mining in the U.S. because they think it's bad for the environment, whereas there are other ones that say, no, no, we want all the hash rates so we can censor it. Um, I'd argue they're, they're probably a little smarter. Uh, than the other ones, um, but they're, I, I would disagree with their ethics. But basically, there's there's two factions for multiple different issues. And I think with stable coins, on one hand, the argument for letting stable coins proliferate from the U.S. government perspective is that basically, even as certain countries might try to de-dollarize from the top-down level, their people are certainly not de-dollarizing yet. And if they want dollars, this is a more efficient way to get them to it. And also, it monetizes treasuries. Right. Uh, basically, it allows yeah. people to around the world to save in indirectly into treasuries. Yeah, um, Tyler's like a cash cow with that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and so that's that's just a new source of dollar and treasury demand mm -hmm. um, that's that's available in this rather decentralized way. Not that the stablecoins decentralized, but that the, the the demand for those products is pretty decentralized. Like if you're an Egyptian doctor or an Ar Argentinian engineer, there's there's 
there's you know there's billions of people in the world that might want to hold some dollars in some way um uh but they don't like the fact that they can't fully control it um now they tether can and other stable coins can still freeze um units it's not like bitcoin that that's that's why they're centralized they can freeze certain units that are thought to be associated with crime um they they can generally be tracked with various um you know on-chain analysis and things like that um so I think the government has been rather slow to fully go after it because from their perspective, it's giving them both pros and cons. Um, It's not super private, um, but it does give people more access to the dollar. So I've generally viewed stable coins as the other productive use of blockchain technology other than Bitcoin itself. Um, But I kind of view it as inherently an intermediate step. It's something that the U.S. government could shut down at any time. And it's also something that, you know, eventually if the U.S. dollar itself, you know, kind of loses control, um, then stable coins aren't really helpful. Well, you know, staying on that thought of the forces of freedom versus the forces of control, you recently tweeted um, something and you hashtagged, I think, fourth turning. Can you elaborate a little bit? I mean, do you see... um, do you see this sort of tension moving forward that's going to accelerate? Because on the one hand, we see bullish signs, like you you mentioned, politicians are starting to understand the energy benefits of, of Bitcoin, and we have institutions coming in, potentially providing more traditional rails for investment like ETFs. But then on the flip side, you see, you know, uh, chase in the uk saying that you can no longer purchase crypto and they're trying to cut off the rails um that go from fiat to to something like bitcoin so how do you see this playing out and do you do you think that we are in that sort of fourth turning where this will be a little bit of a of a battle i do and i think that that book was useful in terms of putting some societal things in perspective um basically there's like a natural entropy to existing orders or existing institutions where during a certain era an institution gets built it could be it could be a little institution or it could be like an idea a framework for government something like that and over time as condi- as the world changes those institutions are an increasing mismatch to the, the you know the people that they're serving and they're also likely to get increasingly corrupted basically that the, the incentives over time change the institution becomes stagnant you rarely ever see even if you look at say corporations you rarely ever see a corporation disrupt itself um so it's never like the winner in one era and then it disrupts itself and it's the winner in the next era too uh, that happens exceedingly rarely it's usually that you need fresh blood you need fresh startups coming along with a new idea and they're willing to try to disrupt the larger establishment uh company and so generally what we see now is that in this current environment, a lot of the institutions um, have experienced this. So people have very generally low um, approval or low uh, favorability towards most of our institutions. So if, you say, what, what do yeah. you, so if you say, what do you think of Congress? What do you think of um, uh, corporate media? What do you think of the FDA? What do you think of you know, almost anything you can list? Uh, it's generally quite negative. And that wasn't always the case, and I, and I think there's a lot of reasons why it's 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 happened. And I think that you know another thing I find interesting about the fourth turning concept is so they they argue that roughly every 80 years or so this happens. Basically, it's like the fourth generation. So it's like just long enough that they they're they're the generation that doesn't that wasn't really around during the prior crisis, um, and that's kind of a, a period of change. And it could be changed for the worse, it could be changed for the better, but that, that period of change is always disruptive. And for me, what makes it less like woo-woo, like less like uh, astrology or something, is that when you look at the long-term debt cycle, uh, it matches up with the fourth turnings. So, you know, like the, the kind of the long-term debt accumulation and then recapitalization of the base layer of money, that always happens during these fourth turnings. Or historically, that's been the case for these, these modern fourth turnings, the last three or so. Um, and so institutions also are you know you can it like the central banks are institutions for example it, it's 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 there's a lot of different types of institutions and that period of currency itself or money itself going through a transformation is inherently kind of a fourth turning type of environment so i i generally do view us as being in this in this kind of strong fork in the road moment where things that kind of happen over the next 5 10 15 years are going to ripple through the next century. This is kind of like the era where we see kind of what institutions arise, which, which, which forces win, 
and what kind of sets the playbook for the next period. So, you know, back in World War II, whoever won that war, that that has a lot of impact for the next, say, century. Whereas mm -hmm. there were fewer things in later decades where if this didn't go a certain way, it would change the course of history. So generally what you see during fourth thirdings is that it's a period of strife, it's a period of change, and it's a period of heightened importance in many ways. Um, and I think what's the scary thing about it is that when you have a corrupt establishment, you get calls for calls for changing that establishment, but some of those calls are from people that would even be worse, right? I mean, that that's that's how kind of history goes, which is that sometimes you replace a bad thing with a worse thing. Whereas countries that have been successful, when they go through fourth turnings, they manage to replace uh, the prior thing with a better thing, or at least an equally but but different thing. Um, and you can also get kind of these more dangerous environments. So I think that it's important for people to kind of, you know, put themselves out there and say what they stand for and to try to, I think, do their small part to influence things in the way that they view as, you know, in high integrity, good values, that kind of stuff. Because I do think that this is a, a pretty meaningfully important period of time. That is really interesting. You know, I've I've been sort of critical recently of the fourth turning book because I almost saw it as a little bit of generational horoscopes where anyone can kind of fit into any of the categories. But the way that you put it actually is a lot more compelling. Um, and you do see this transformational period we're in because technology is accelerating, not just with Bitcoin, but with AI and robotics and energy and all of these things culminating, I think it is going to be a period of intense um, transformation for all of us, as well as the work that that's happening. All right, as we start to wrap up, um, what was the biggest surprise as you were reading this and doing all this thorough research? What's something um, from this experience where you were like, I did not expect that, or, or this is the, the thing I learned most um, through the process? I think one of the biggest surprises was how quickly the Bretton Woods system unwound. Um, so we, we generally think of the Bretton Woods system as going from 1944 to 1971. Whereas when you actually look into the details, uh, it didn't really become fully operational until the late 1950s. And so the period of time in which it failed was something like 12 or 13 years. Um, and it started to fail immediately from the implementation. So gold reserves in the US started going straight down uh, once it was fully implemented, because you just currently you can't inherently back a a fraction reserved ever increasing unit the dollar with something far more scarce. You're eventually you're going to break the peg, um, and so it was kind of surprising that they thought it would work. Uh, and a lot of people will say, you know, the bad decisions that were made in 1971, but really it's a series of decisions that led all the way to that moment. By the time 1971 came around, the system was already long broken. It was already unrecoverable. And I, again, that kind of goes back to the argument of technological determinism, that it kind of mm -hmm. had to happen that way and a few other ways would have made sense. Um, and so I think that's, that reading of history, I think was the somewhat surprising thing is that almost anything you try would fail um, because in that technological environment of fast uh, transactions and slow settlements, uh, things keep abstracting and expanding and breaking over and over again. And to me, that was like the, the, the sheer speed of that, how, the, how quickly that system collapsed was surprising to me. Wow. Well, you can read all about it. This book, again, phenomenal, Lynn. And before, um, before we get going, for all my macro bugs out there, since I have you, uh, what's your big macro takeaway summary for all the folks wondering when hard landing, when pivot, when money printer? Uh, what's your 30,000 foot view of what is happening right now and how long it's taking for the economy to, to, to crash in some way? I would describe it as two competing forces that are roughly equal at the moment. So the Federal Reserve tightening is putting a lot of downward pressure on certain industries, but it's so far it's only certain industries. So it's it's basically entities that have debt that is rather short duration and and has to be refinanced. And so the question is who is that group? So it's commercial real estate, it's uh, junk rated companies, and then it's generally small businesses that rely more on bank financing than bond financing, right? So those are the groups that have generally been more negatively impacted by the Fed's tightening efforts. On the other hand, if you locked in long duration debt with a mortgage or uh, your corporation with like, you know, 30 year 
bonds, um, they're relatively like protected from these rising rates. And in some cases, they're actually benefiting from them. So for example, if you were um, Apple and you have about as much cash as you have debt, but the debt is locked in with low duration, low long duration uh, interest rates, and then the cash pile is variable and you're, you're holding a lot of T-bills and you're kind of making a lot of money, then the higher interest rates actually stimulate uh, you know, companies that are more cash rich, uh, as, as well as like, you know, if you're a wealthy retiree that, you know, has, uh, you know, a home with like a low fixed mortgage attached to it to, to kind of short the currency. And then you, you're holding large amounts of cash and money markets yeah. and things like that. You're doing quite well in this environment. So on one hand, the, the ongoing deficit spending, especially from the interest side, but also just from the whole deficit spending is very stimulative. Um, and the Fed tightening is is damaging to certain areas of the economy. Um, and so I kind of viewed it as this kind of intermediate period where for some, for some people it already feels like a recession and other people are saying this is great. And I think that we're in a more industry specific type of environment because of these unusual forces. And I think it can potentially persist as long as the reverse repo facility still has funds in it, because that's largely what has allowed for this fiscal expansion to occur while the Fed remains tight. Um, I think the environment changes once we get to a point where the Fed is no longer able to remain tight because you get that oversupply of treasuries flooding the market. But right now the reverse repo facility represents kind of the, the last kind of area of money that can easily go into treasuries. Well, you called it a while ago. You said things would be choppy, and they certainly are. Um, thank you so much, Lynn, for taking the time. Your book is incredible. I recommend everyone to get it. It's on Amazon. Um, I will link it in the show notes. You're also working on an audio book, right? So people will be able to listen if they like uh, audio versions. Um, thank you so much. Any any final thoughts? I think that covers it. I think um, you know, money is one of those things that can be boring to a lot of people, but I think it's really important to learn about it. I think it's, you know, one of those like top five things to be familiar with. Um, and what I try to do with the book is even though it's long, I try to make it very accessible uh, to kind of walk the person through the whole history of money. And I think, you know, there's a lot of things out there that aim at being sensationalist or aim at kind of presenting one side of it. Whereas I do my absolute best to try to make it down to earth and then try to show why intelligent people might see things a little bit differently than each other and kind of walk through some of the path for how we got to where we are. It is so well written. Thank you so much, Lynn. It's fascinating. You'll learn all about the history of money and banking and the gold standard and Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and everything. I mean, there's nothing that you didn't cover. I'm going to proudly display it next to my my three books by Saifedean. Uh, so it'll be in my background. Thank you so much, Lynn. Hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for checking out the video version of my show. If you want to see more content like this, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and hit like on the video. And please reach out with feedback or guest suggestions. My email is natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. I'll see you next time.